so thank you so much for joining me uh, to talk all things sexual pleasure. What I think is an overlooked aspect of sexual health and sexual well-being. Um, and before I uh, begin, I just want to acknowledge that I'm joining you all today from the UBC West Point Great Campus, uh, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and stolen territories of the Musqueam people. Um, and I really encourage you to take a moment to reflect and acknowledge the original owners and caretakers of the lands and territories where uh, you are located and where you um, have and continue to benefit uh, from those lands and territories. So let's dive in. So World Sexual Health Day, let's talk pleasure. So hopefully I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey uh, today, um, focused on talking about all things pleasure. Uh, this is a topic that I've been thinking uh, deeply about over the last year or so in large part um, because my field of uh, sexuality research, uh, we lost a giant, Dr. Ellen Lan, uh, earlier this year in January of 2022. Uh, um, and Ellen was incredible in so many different ways. Um, her work was really impactful uh, for the field, but myself included. Um, and though her contributions to our understanding of sexuality, um, especially women's sexuality in particular, were tremendous. Um, Ellen actually focused the last part of her career on initiating conversations and advocating for sexual pleasure. And her legacy really is this message that women and men are equally equipped for sexual pleasure. And yet we see this huge disparity between them, this large pleasure gap, which I'll be talking about a lot today. So much of my talk is really uh, informed by ideas, influenced by Ellen's work, especially the uh, last few years where she's focused a lot on championing sexual pleasure for all people. So I wanna start my talk today by getting everyone on the same page with respect to sexual health and sexual being, what are these things? And then I'm gonna hone in and focus our conversation on sexual pleasure. What are the benefits of sexual pleasure for health, well-being, for relationships? And I'm going to talk a lot about this pleasure gap and why it's problematic. So this is the gap that we most often see between uh, cisgender heterosexual men and women's pleasure experiences. I'm going to share some of my research to date on sexual interest, sexual arousal, and sexual desire, and how this might help us to understand whether or not this pleasure gap is innate or whether it's constructed and might be due to other factors like opportunity. In the second part of the talk, I wanna share some of um, the ways in which my lab, so the SWAL lab here at UBC, are initiating conversations about sexual pleasure. Um, and that's through knowledge sharing via social media. So trying to close the pleasure gap. And then at the end, I wanna leave you with some ideas that I have around where we need to go next as the field, and how we can continue to have these really important conversations about sexual pleasure in the work that we do, whether it be research, clinical work, education, or even policy. So let's jump in. So the World Health Organization, way back in 2010, that seems like a long time ago now, they stated that sexual health is fundamental to the physical and emotional health and well-being of individuals, couples, and families. So that sounds pretty great. Um, sexual health, according to the WHO, they say that it requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility, so not a guarantee, the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences with a focus on these experiences being free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. And I just wanna highlight here that while they mention the word pleasure, that's kind of where it ends. So the WHO goes on to say that the ability of people to achieve sexual health and sexual well-being really depends on four things. So one, access to comprehensive, good quality information about sex and sexuality. Two, knowledge about the risks they may face and the vulnerability that they may have to adverse consequences of unprotected sex. Three, the ability to access sexual health care. And four, living in an environment that affirms and promotes sexual health. So we can see there kind of these four pillars, none of which um, kind of mention or even nudge towards sexual pleasure. You'll hear me talk today a little bit about sexual well-being. And so sexual being is different from sexual health 
in my opinion, um, in that it represents a more holistic approach to sexuality that really goes beyond the absence of disease or the absence of dysfunction that we really see highlighted in that World Health Organization definition. So sexual being to me includes behavioral indicators, so things like how frequently a person might engage in various sexual activities, as well as their subjective experiences. So things like positive aspects of sexuality, so a person's level of desire or interest in being sexual, as well as uh, their overall level of sexual satisfaction, which may or may not be contingent on sexual activity. Sexual well-being also captures um, kind of negative aspects of sexuality, like sexual distress. So this would be worries or concerns that a person has around their sexuality or sex life. And what we know from research is that these facets of sexual being are related. So we see that there's uh, they're positively correlated, um, though not necessarily to the extent that you might expect. So for, for example, we know from research that people often engage in sex without desire, um, and that not being sexually active doesn't necessarily mean that someone is not sexually satisfied. So we see um, in the work that we do um, with individuals and couples that uh, sexual being can kind of uh, co-occur, but also can show these kind of distinct or disparate trajectories over time. So that brings me to sexual pleasure, the conversation we're having today. So we have sexual health, we have sexual being on either side here. Are these things different from sexual pleasure? So the World Association for Sexual Health, or WAS, recently adopted sexual pleasure as the cornerstone of sexual health. So they're kind of housing it within sexual health. And prior to this, sexual pleasure was not really in the picture. It was definitely not part of the conversations that we were having. I've been in this field for you know, over 12 years now and really haven't been talking about sexual pleasure. When we look at the research, we see a lot of focus on sexual health outcomes, you know, like STIs, HIV, that makes a lot of sense. Um, these are important health concerns. Uh, we see a lot of research on sexual function or dysfunction, as well as sexual well-being outcomes like sexual desire. But we actually have very little research looking solely at the outcome of sexual pleasure. And interestingly, as I prepared for this talk and some of the research that we're doing in my lab, we actually don't even have reliable valid measures uh, to assess sexual pleasure, especially assessing sexual pleasure in a really inclusive way um, for people of all kind of gender sexes, sexual orientations, relationship constellations. So what is sexual pleasure? WAS defines sexual pleasure as the physical and or psychological satisfaction and enjoyment derived from shared or solitary erotic experiences, including thoughts, fantasies, dreams, emotions, and feelings. So I'm gonna take a minute here to break this down because I think there's so much to love about this new definition of sexual pleasure. So first, the definition really highlights that pleasure can be either physical or psychological or both. And I think that this is so important because it really helps to move us away from this unitary definition of pleasure that I think has been perpetuated definitely in research, but also in the mainstream media, that pleasure is equated with the physical experience of orgasm. And that's it. I think this is so important because while orgasm might be one determinant of pleasure for some folks, Sex can be pleasurable for so many different reasons, even in the absence of that physical orgasm. So for example, the intimacy or connection that a person feels to their partner during a sexual experience, um, that could be experienced as pleasurable and is totally independent from whether or not um, orgasm occurred. The next part I love, um, I love this because it's so inclusive. So it really situates sexual pleasure um, across many contexts. So here it says that pleasure can be a shared experience, um, I would argue with one or more people, or it can be a solitary experience, something that someone experiences independently or alone. And I really appreciate this um, part of the WAS definition because it decenters the focus on certain types of sex acts. Um, we have, you know, sexual scripts, we have sociocultural messaging around uh, sex and sexual pleasure. And I find that often uh, these, these messages or scripts 
center around certain types of sexual activities like penile vaginal intercourse um, and certain types of activities that occur between certain types of people. So um, most notably uh, cisgender heterosexual men and women. And this is problematic for um, a whole host of reasons. Um, but in particular, it's problematic because then only certain sex acts are pursued um, and that these might actually be sex acts that are not actually associated uh, with the highest likelihood of experiencing sexual pleasure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here, this definition really captures that pleasure is experienced in a variety of different erotic activities and contexts, and it really makes space for folks to experience pleasure in their own way, which I think is so, uh, so important. And so lastly, we can see here that pleasure can be derived from many different sources, not just the physical act of sex. And this includes thoughts and fantasies, but then also a person's affective or experience, um, like the emotions and feelings that come up for them. And what I really love about this part of the definition is that it really creates space for pleasure to be a lifelong journey for folks. So we know that various aspects of sexuality ebb and flow throughout the lifespan. Um, so I think that this part of the definition really allows people the opportunity to have, um, you know, varied opportunities for sexual pleasure um, that aren't, you know, just centered on the physical experience of sex. So why should we care about sexual pleasure? Are there any benefits? So though I would argue that there is limited research to date that's focused on sexual pleasure outcomes directly, um, the research that we do have suggests that pleasure is really an important determinant of health and well-being. So we know from research that maintaining an active sex life has a number of different benefits. So for example, engaging in regular sex is associated with better heart health, uh, reduced risk of some cancers, stronger immune systems, better mental health. Um, it can even be associated with living longer. So all good things that we should all strive for. Um, we know that sex is an important contributor to the quality and longevity of romantic relationships. And in one study of over 300,000 people, it revealed that being in a strong and satisfying romantic relationship, which we know can be strengthened by having a strong sexual connection with your partner, was just as good a predictor of how long someone will live as known risk factors like smoking and alcohol use. And it was an even better predictor of living longer as risk factors like obesity and physical inactivity. So really it highlights the importance of sex and sexual activity and sexual pleasure for health, well-being, and longevity. What's even more interesting about this data is that the quality of sex, not just the quantity, so we shouldn't just be aiming for lots of sex, but the quality of the sex really matters too. So better quality sex, more pleasurable sex uh, is associated with even better health outcomes. So sex is important, sexual pleasure is really important. There's all these benefits. Why haven't we been talking about it? I think it's really relevant to note that there's so many barriers um, you know, in the field of sexuality uh, in general, but also sexual pleasure more specifically that have existed up until this point that have really prevented us from initiating these conversations around sexual pleasure. So a couple that are noteworthy, uh, Western religious traditions, you know, have really perpetuated beliefs around sex as dangerous, um, that have stigmatized women's sexuality and women's sexual pleasure in particular. We also see in medicine and other related disciplines, um, sex has been narrowly defined. Um, so I would say that typically uh, sex has been defined as focused on procreative acts, uh, really ignoring pleasure. Pleasure is seen as this kind of frivolous add-on. And together, I would say that these influences have furthered the idea that sex should occur in certain circumstances, um, like monogamous, heterosexual, committed relationships, and should not occur outside of these uh, contexts, which is problematic um, and has perpetuated uh, some of the problems with uh, sexual pleasure and the pleasure gaps that uh, we'll talk about later on. Public health education um, has also been part of the 
So I'm sure if you take a minute, if any of you received any kind of, um, you can probably recall that most of the sex ed you received, if you received it at all, uh, focused on adverse outcomes. So risks associated with sex and what generally was quite sex negative. Time pleasure was entirely absent from the discussion. And really, I think this was driven by fears that if sex was presented in a balanced way, not even a positive way, just balanced, um, that this might entice young people to engage in sex too early or before they're actually able to consent. Um, but what the data suggests um, couldn't be further from this. So the data really suggests that comprehensive sex ed, uh, sex ed that doesn't even include conversations about pleasure necessarily, actually leads to better outcomes. So later sexual debut, so later um, first sexual experience, higher rates of contraceptive use, fewer unwanted pregnancies. And importantly, there is some data to suggest um, more pleasurable first sexual experiences. So people are getting off to a better first start on their sexual journey. So moving on, um, we know from the limited data out there that not all people, unfortunately, will have equal opportunities for pleasurable sexual experiences. Um, sexual pleasure seems to be embedded within a fairly gendered patriarchal context. And in most societies around the world, we see that heterosexual women's pleasure in particular is not prioritized and is actually de-emphasized relative to heterosexual men's pleasure. And then we see other factors that further influence this divide, um, including things like religiosity, gender roles, and sexual scripts. And then these are exacerbated by things like um, media popularization of sex, uh, porn, and other factors. So while much of the research that we do here in the sexuality and well-being lab is inclusive with respect to gender sex, sexual orientation, relationship constellations, the existing research on sexual pleasure, um, I find has really focused on the gendered experience of pleasure. So at present, the majority of research is really focused on this pleasure gap that we see. So these are differences between uh, cishet men and cishet women in their experience or opportunity for sexual pleasure. So while the remainder of my talk is going to focus on factors that might um, contribute to this gendered pleasure experience or the pleasure gap, uh, this is in no way intended to communicate that studying pleasure experiences among, among other groups or even within groups, because I'm sure there's a lot of within group variability too. Um, this is not to communicate that that's not important or worthy to, of study. Um, I'm actually going to circle back to that idea of how we can move the field forward with respect to these knowledge gaps at the end of my talk. So I just want to preface that before we uh, move on. So in preparation for this talk um, on our social media, on Instagram, we shared some sexual pleasure facts, some of which I've peppered in uh, today. And so this is the first fact that we shared, and I'm sure many of you have heard this before. Um, this is about the orgasm gap. So the orgasm gap is one of the biggest gender differences in sexuality and sexual pleasure that we have. Um, even though we like to say that there's many differences between men and women, um, the research suggests that those differences, for the most part, are relatively small, but this one is a large uh, gender difference. So Frederick and colleagues, in a large study of over 50,000 people, so that's huge, uh, they found that while men of all sexual orientations were more likely to orgasm than women, the largest pleasure gap or the largest orgasm gap was between cishet men and cishet women. And while 95% of cishet men usually or always orgasm during sexual activity, only 65% of women do. And then when we take that a little step further and we look at just penetrative sexual activity or penile vaginal intercourse, the gap gets even bigger, not good, uh, with only 35% of women reporting that they usually or always orgasm. So some of you might be thinking, you know, perhaps this pleasure gap, you know, 60% if we're looking at penile vaginal intercourse means that women just have less capacity for orgasm than men. And maybe this is based on differences in biology or physiology. Um, but what we know is that when women have sex with women, they report orgasming around 90% of the time 
And when women masturbate, they report orgasming 95% of the time. So what this suggests is that perhaps there's not some innate difference between women and men, but instead something specific about this partnered context, specifically women having sex with men, that contribute or perpetuate this pleasure gap that we're seeing. So a lot of my research program over the last 12 or so years has examined the ways in which men and women are similar as well as different with respect to their sexual interest, their arousal, and their desire. And I think some of this work has implications for our understanding of whether women and men differ in their capacity for pleasure or rather differ, differ in their opportunities for pleasurable sex. So in a lot of my research, uh, we look at patterns of visual attention to sexual stimuli. And so we're interested in visual attention because we think it's an index of sexual interest, so what people are sexually interested in. And in these studies, we typically invite folks to come into our lab where they're instructed that they're going to see images or videos um, on what looks like a computer monitor. And so while they're viewing these stimuli, we're actually recording their eye movements using eye tracking technology. So the position of their eye on the screen. Uh, really here, we're interested in where people are looking, how long they look, and then how this viewing pattern corresponds with things like what their reported attraction to the images or how aroused they report feeling. So in a series of studies over the last six or so years with hundreds of participants, uh, we consistently find that women and men both attend to sexual stimuli in really similar ways. So we see that sexual stimuli relative to non-sexual stimuli uh, capture and sustain men's and women's visual attention. And what's interesting uh, and goes against popular opinion is that women relative to men actually respond to a broader range of sexual stimuli. So what I mean by this is that women will actually look more frequently um, and for longer at all different types of sexual stimuli, not just the stimuli that match their sexual orientation, whereas in men we actually see that they tend to only look at stimuli that match their sexual orientation. And so taken together, the evidence from eye tracking research suggests that women have equal, if not greater, visual interest in sexual stimuli. Some of my other work uh, focuses on patterns of genital arousal. That's right, we measure genital response in the lab. So in these studies, we invite people into the lab. Uh, they're instructed to insert or attach a genital gauge, so something called a genital plethysmograph, um, privately, uh, uh, alone in a room. And so these are validated measures that assess changes in vasocongestion or genital blood flow. So in people with vulvas and vaginas, we're measuring changes in vasocongestion either internally in the vagina or externally within the clitoris. And in people with penises, we're assessing changes in penile circumference that occur during an erection. Participants are alone in the room where they're watching videos um, or listening to stories uh, that depict different sexual activities. So this could be masturbation or um, two people having sex. And we're recording their physiological responses as they view these stimuli. Usually in these studies, we're interested in the magnitude of response, so um, how large the response is, um, especially across a range of stimuli. So we might expect weaker responses to less intense stimuli, like seeing a new person uh, with more intense or greater responses to um, stimuli depicting two people having sex. So in this work, uh, we again see that women and men are both easily uh, aroused in the lab we're able to elicit similar and high degrees of arousal. And in some studies, we actually see that women's responses have a faster onset. So they actually appear to be more easily or more quickly aroused uh, than uh, people with penises. And we also see similar to the data I just presented on eye tracking, that women can also be aroused by a greater variety of stimuli than men. So again, we're not really seeing differences in capacity for genital arousal. And so we captured this um, in another sexual pleasure fact. So all people have equal capacity for arousal. 
So really trying to debunk this idea or this myth that men are the more easily aroused um, gender sex and thus sex is more pleasurable for them. Um, so we argue that sex is likely more pleasurable for men because they're having more reliable orgasms, especially within that partner dynamic. Um, but actually the ease with which women and men uh, become genitally aroused, at least in our laboratory context, um, doesn't seem to differ. So last but not least, sexual desire. So I'm sure many of us have heard at one time or another that men have higher sex drives or have higher desire than women, as though it's some innate biologically based hardwired difference. Um, and indeed, a lot of the initial research um, on desire or sex drives supported this argument, in large part because of the way that sexual desire was being conceptualized and defined, and then also how we were assessing it. And so when sexual desire is conceptualized as a trait, so something that's stable um, and assessed using items like how frequently a person has sex or how frequently they think about sex, uh, we do indeed see that men tend to report higher desire on average than women. I wanna draw your attention to some of our more recent work though on something called responsive desire. Um, so this is desire that emerges from the experience of arousal or through activation of a sexual response system. And the reason I think this distinction is really important is because responsive desire captures more of one's capacity coupled with opportunity. So in a series of studies, we were really interested in examining responsive desire. So desire that happens kind of following arousal or that emerges from arousal. And in these studies, we again invite folks into the lab, they're watching videos or listening to audio stories of various sexual activities. And we were interested in examining whether or not uh, women and men would differ in their reported levels of sexual desire following exposure to different types of sexual stimuli. And what we and others have found is that women and men actually report similar levels of responsive desire in the lab. And what I think this means is that when paired with an appropriate stimulus or the right opportunity, so if we take this outside of the laboratory context, um, maybe the right sexual partner, um, a responsive sexual partner perhaps, uh, men and women seem to have similar capacity to experience responsive sexual desire and perhaps in turn sexual pleasure. So taken together, this research really suggests that women and men do not seem to differ in their capacity for interest, arousal, desire, but we still see this pleasure gap between cishet women and men. So what's going on? You know, the data really suggests that this might be driven by differences in opportunity for pleasurable sex, rather than differences between women and men in their capacity. And I think that this is somewhat good news because I think we you know, can create opportunities for everyone to have a better, more pleasurable sex. And one of the ways in which I think we can do this is through uh, better education. So one way to bridge the pleasure gap, um, given that I don't think that it's innate, is through sexual education. So let's try and equip people uh, with the knowledge that they need to have better, more pleasurable sex. We know from a number of older studies that poor sexual knowledge has some pretty significant consequences for people's sexualities and their relationships. A comprehensive sex education that really moves away from a disease or risk-based model towards increasing knowledge and promotion of not only the benefits of sex, but pleasure, um, I think will be essential to reducing gender differences in opportunities for sexual pleasure that we currently see. And one of the ways that our lab is contributing to conversations around pleasure and comprehensive sexual um, health information is through our social media. So in 2021, we launched the SOAP study, so the Sexual Opinions, Attitudes and Knowledge study. And here we were really interested in understanding what are the types of myths or misinformation that, about sex that people endorse, who's likely to endorse these myths, and then is myth endorsement um, associated with negative outcomes? So in terms of who is most likely to endorse myths about sex, uh, we were uh, interested in looking at things like uh, sex assigned at birth, 
gender identity, sexual orientation, and sexual experience, in large part because we think that if people experience um, access to the sexual health information or sex ed, it's probably targeted towards certain groups like cis hat individuals. Um, so some groups might be more vulnerable to, you know, sexual misinformation, um, given that the information out there is not targeted towards them. We also looked at other factors like religiosity, political stance, where folks grew up, uh, age as other relevant variables. So what we did is an online study that we launched um, last year. And to participate in the study, people needed to be 18 and have access to the internet. We recruited a large uh, sample from undergraduate students here at UBC, as well as uh, an online sample largely through Reddit, super successful way to recruit uh, folks if you're interested. And in the end, we ended up with almost 4,500 people uh, with a mean age of around 28.6 years, but we actually had people kind of a really broad um, age range, which was awesome. With respect to some of our socio -de demographics, we had slightly more um, assigned female at birth, um, and the majority of our sample were cisgender. Uh, we had great diversity with respect to sexual orientation. Uh, so what you can see here um, are values that quite closely approximate what we see with respect to prevalence rates in the general population, uh, which is really exciting with respect to kind of generalizability of some of these findings. And so what we asked participants to do is we presented them with 75 different myths about sex that we generated um, iteratively in our lab. And so these included things like masturbation is unhealthy, good sex always involves orgasm, and the more sex you have, the happier you'll be. So kind of these statements that we think we see uh, kind of popular, popularized in social media, in mass media, um, that we wanted to try and see if people are actually endorsing these things. So for each myth, participants rated their level of agreement from strongly disagree to strongly agree, or if they truly didn't know they had that option to select, um, I don't know. As I mentioned, we were interested in looking at uh, whether or not myth endorsement was influenced by whether or not a person was assigned female versus male at birth. Uh, their gender identity, cisgender versus trans, their sexual orientation. So here for this analysis, we looked at majoritized versus minoritized identities, as well as kind of a broad index of sexual experience. So we looked at number of sexual partners. So in order to answer this question about who are most likely to endorse myths about sex, um, we entered all four variables simultaneously into a regression model to predict total myth score. So what did we find? So our data revealed that being cisgender, assigned male at birth, and with a majoritized sexual orientation, so in this case heterosexual, was associated with greater myth endorsement. So I'm just going to let that like soak in for a second. Cisgender, male, heterosexual. Remember a little bit earlier in the presentation when I was talking about the orgasm gap, specifically this gap between cishet men and cishet women? Is it possible that part of the pleasure gap that we see might be linked with cishet men's poor sexual knowledge or greater myth endorsement? Though I would argue this is likely not the only factor, um, it's possible if um, cisgender heterosexual men have poor sexual knowledge and poor understanding of sexual pleasure in particular, this might translate into sexual experiences with their women partners that are not particularly pleasurable or rewarding for their partners, thereby contributing to the orgasm gap. Other factors that were associated with uh, myth endorsement, we saw that being older, um, having higher levels of religiosity, holding more conservative political views, um, were all associated with greater myth endorsement. And what was a little surprising to us initially, but we've now wrapped our heads around, is that taking ever taking a human sexuality class um, at university was also associated with myth endorsement. And so it's important to note that these data are correlational. And so one possibility is that people who endorse more myths, likely because they haven't had access to information, may actually be more motivated to take a human sexuality class. 
And indeed, anecdotally, when I'm teaching human sexuality here at UBC, many of my students comment about how new the information is for them, how sex was never talked about in their homes or their culture or their schools growing up. So I definitely think that might be one factor that's contributing to this finding. Similar to the data on sexual pleasure having benefits for sex and relationships, we also found in our data that having poor access to sexual health information might be a risk factor for additional problems. So we found in our study that having higher uh, myth endorsement was associated with lower levels of sexual and relationship satisfaction. So how satisfied you feel with your relationship with your partner. So putting this all together, some people are more likely to endorse sexual myths, namely cishet men, as well as more religious, older conservative folks. And myth endorsement does seem to be a risk factor for sexual and relationship problems. So while this might seem like bad news, um, there are things that we can do about it. So once we had this data in the lab, we were really excited to use this as the basis of our social media knowledge sharing initiative. And so this is how Misconceptions was born in the lab. And so this is one way that our lab is working to address sexual misinformation, trying to reduce the pleasure gap. And so this was a project that we started around 18 months ago on Instagram. The goal here is simple. We wanna debunk the commonly endorsed myths using our own data. Um, using the latest sexuality science that's being published in the field. And I just want to note that this has been a lab-wide effort. Um, undergrads in my lab have largely been leading and generating the content. Um, and our communications coordinator, Natasha Zippin, oversees the content um, and develops and generates all of the beautiful graphics um, that we use on our social media. So here's an example of one of the myths that we recently debunked. Um, so this myth, matching levels of sexual desire between partners is important. Uh, 66 people have, uh, in our study agreed that this was uh, true um, or you know, agreed that having the same level of desire as their partner uh, was really important. Um, but what we know from science is that mismatches in desire are really common and that matching in desire is not actually associated with higher sexual and relationship satisfaction. So mismatches in desire aren't necessarily problematic. And I think this kind of messaging is important given that um, desire discrepancies are one of the most common problems that couples seek help for. So in our lab, we're also interested in evaluating is misconceptions like an effective way to share this type of information. So my incredible grad student, Kiara O'Kane, along with two phenomenal undergraduates, Anthony Yuen and Stephanie Chen, just wrapped up data collection on a follow-up study um, to SOAK. So here we're evaluating whether or not misconceptions is effective um, as a way to share sexuality science and debunk myths. Um, we don't yet have our data analyzed, um, but we're measuring things like whether or not there's knowledge change before and after exposure to misconceptions, um, whether or not people would seek out information on social media around sexual health, um, where else they might suggest. So stay tuned. Um, but as a little bit of a teaser, some of the qualitative information um, that participants have shared with us is that having the information on Instagram makes it super accessible. Um, people are finding that the posts are really informative, that they're learning um, new things. And also, um, thinking us for educating them in a really digestible way. So translating that science in a way that they can understand it and make use of that information in their daily lives, which I think is awesome. So before I wrap up, I just wanna talk about where do we go from here? Um, you know, so give you some food for thought before we jump into our Q and A. Our dedicated research with sexual pleasure as the outcome especially among understudied groups. So this includes gender and sexually diverse people, racialized folks. Um, I wanna highlight how understudied pleasure is among transgender and gender diverse people. Um, in particular, there's an abundance of kind of uh, research on the medicalization um, rather than kind of these positive aspects of sex. Um, and there's a real need to understand the differences in similarities and diversity in the experiences of pleasure within and across populations um, so that we can minimize the pleasure gap and work towards um, equality and sexual pleasure. And I think that this might be particularly fruitful for us to learn from one another. Perhaps knowledge gained from studying pleasure in one group might 
help us to address barriers that other groups are facing with respect to their sexual pleasure. Perhaps not surprising, we really need inclusive, evidence-based, pleasure-focused sex education for everybody. So our work on sexual myths clearly identifies that some groups are more vulnerable to sexual misinformation than others. And ideally, if we're creating um, evidence-based, pleasure-focused sex ed, we would start these conversations really early with developmentally appropriate um, knowledge that best prepares people, not only for their own, but also if they so choose, their partner's sexual pleasure too. It's probably not too surprising that we see things like pleasure gaps between women and men, given that for many years, sex education, if it was offered at all, was gender sex segregated. So people were only receiving information about their own bodies. And lastly, I think we also really need to start um, linking uh, research on pleasure with other sexual outcomes. You know, I want to know for how and for whom um, does pleasurable sex benefit? How can we harness this information to help address other problems like experiences of low sexual desire or relationship problems? One direction that our lab is taking and one question that we're super excited about is the link between pleasure and desire, uh, including desire discrepancies or differences in level of, levels of desire between romantic partners. And so this is work that's being spearheaded by my incredible graduate student, Marta Kubuszewska. And so somewhat surprisingly, there's actually very little research on this topic. Um, perhaps like, you know, uh, people's desire for sex or lack thereof is related to differences in how rewarding or pleasurable sex is. It makes perfect sense if sex is bad or unrewarding, you might not be interested in having that sex. Kind of like if the only thing on offer for dinner is something you don't like, you might choose to skip it instead. So if sex and sexual pleasure is more of a buffet, where there's something for everyone, perhaps we wouldn't see these discrepancies in desire. So does pleasure foster desire? We think it might. We know that sexual pleasure um, is the primary motor motivator for sexual interactions. And so it follows that one important factor influencing the degree to which people might desire sex, especially desire partnered sex, might be the pleasure that they experience. So we are super excited to delve into this world, uh, this work to better understand these links between pleasure and desire in individuals, but also in couples. So hopefully this talk today has sparked an interest in continuing these conversations around sexual pleasure. We know that people are equally equipped for sexual pleasure, yet pleasure disparities exist, likely between and within groups. And this is problematic because we know that pleasure has important benefits for health, well-being, for relationships. And finally, to bridge this gap, we need pleasure-focused, um, pleasure-centered sex education for all people to better prepare them for the sex that they deserve. Before I end, I just want to acknowledge my incredible team throughout which this work would not at all be possible. So pictured here are my three superstar grad students, Marta, Aaron, and Kiara on the top left, as well as my postdoc Inez. And the remaining team members are undergraduate students here at UBC um, that have been involved in the studies presented or who have created content for misconceptions. And again, a special shout out to Natasha Zippin in the bottom right hand corner for all of her incredible work on our lab social media and the way that we communicate about um, our science. This work would not be possible without our generous um, support from all of our funders. And I just want to thank each of you for joining us today. Um, and thank you for your time. And I look forward to having these conversations about sexual pleasure. <laughs>